There's an ancient proverb, dead men tell no tales. Take a walk through the Spoon River Cemetery, where lie the deceased of the small town, Spoon River. Stop and listen. You may hear the dead citizens deliver their own epitaphs, tales of their lives speaking from their graves. They speak of the things one might expect to hear. Some recite their histories. Others make observations of life from the outside. Some complain of the treatment of their graves. Some tell how they died. They reveal their disappointments in life. Some their success and failures. Where are Cassius, Chase, John, Oscar, Fletcher, the weak of will, the strong of arm, the clown, the boozer, the fighter? All, all are sleeping on the hill. Where are Dora, Lillian, Pauline, Daisy, and Lucinda, the tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one? All. All are sleeping on the hill. Pauline Barrett, who had surgery from which she never fully recovered. Almost the shell of a woman after the surgeon's knife. Almost a year to creep back into strength. Till the dawn of our wedding decennial found me my seeming self again. We walked the forest together along a soundless path of moss and turf. But I could not look in your eyes and you could not look in my eyes for such sorrow was ours. The beginning of gray in your hair and I but a shell of myself. And what did we talk of? <laughs> Sky and water, anything most to hide our thoughts. And then your gift of wild roses set upon the table to grace our dinner. Poor heart, how bravely you struggled to imagine and live a remembered rapture. And then my spirit drooped as the night came on, and you left me alone in my room for a while as you did when I was a bride, poor heart. And I looked in the mirror, and something said, one should be all dead when one is half dead, nor ever mock life, nor ever cheat love. And I did it looking there in the mirror. Dear heart, have you ever understood? John M. Church an attorney who pulled wires with judge and jury. I was attorney for the Q and the indemnity company, which insured the owners of the mine. I pulled the wires with the judge and jury and the upper courts to beat the claims of the cripple, the widow and orphan, and made a fortune thereat. The Bar Association sang my praises in a high-flown resolution, and the floral tributes were many, but the rats devoured my heart and a snake made a nest in my skull. Judge Somers, who lies in an unmarked grave. How does it happen, tell me, that I, who was most erudite of lawyers, who knew Blackstone and Coke almost by heart, who gave the greatest speech the courthouse ever heard and wrote a brief that won the praise of Justice Brees? How does it happen? Tell me that I lie here unmarked, forgotten, 
wild chase Henry, the town drunkard, has a marble block topped by an urn, wherein nature, in a mood ironical, has sown a flowering weed. Chase Henry, the town drunkard. In life, I was the town drunkard. When I died, the priest denied me burial in holy ground, which redounded to my good fortune. For the Protestants bought this lot and buried my body here, close to the grave of the banker Nicholas and his wife Priscilla. Take note ye prudent and pious souls of the cross currents in life, which bring honor to the dead who lived in shame. Lucinda Matlock. She tells a sad story of a tough life. I went to the dances at Chandlerville and played snap out at Winchester. One time, we changed partners, driving home in the moonlight of middle June, and then I found Davis. We were married and lived together for 70 years, enjoying, working, raising the 12 children, eight of whom we lost ere I had reached the age of 60. I spun. I wove, I kept the house, I nursed the sick, I made the garden, and on holiday I rambled through the fields where, where sang the lark, and by Spoon River gathering many a shell and many a flower and medicinal weeds, shouting to the wooded hills, singing to the green valleys. At 96, I had lived enough, that is all, and passed to a sweet repose. What is this I hear about sorrow and weariness, anger, discontent, drooping hopes, Degenerate sons and daughters, life is too strong for you. It takes life to love life. Ali McGee and Fletcher McGee, they tell a story of a troubled marriage. Have you seen walking through the village a man with downcast eyes and haggard face. That is my husband who, by secret cruelty never to be told, robbed me of my youth and my beauty, till at last, wrinkled and with yellow teeth and with broken pride and shameful humility, I sank into the grave. But what thinks you gnaws at my husband's heart? The face of what I was, the face of what he made me, these are driving him to the place where I lie in death. Therefore, I am avenged. She took my strength by minutes. She took my life by hours. She drained me like a fevered moon that saps the spinning world. The days went by like shadows, the minutes wheeled like stars. She took pity from my heart and made it into smiles. She was a hunk of sculptor's clay. My secret thoughts were fingers that flew behind her pensive brow and lined it deep with pain. It set the lips, sagged the cheeks, and drooped the eye with sorrow. My soul had entered in the clay, fighting like seven devils. It was not mine, it was not hers. She held it, but its struggles modeled a face she hated, and a face I feared to see. 
I beat the windows, I shook the bolts, I hid me in a corner. And then she died and haunted me and hunted me for life. Indignation Jones tells how a community can hurt someone. You would not believe it, would you? That I come from good Welsh stock. That I was purer blooded than the white trash here, and of more direct lineage than the New Englanders and Virginians of Spoon River. You would not believe that I had been to school and read some books. You saw me only as a run-down man with matted hair and ragged clothes. Sometimes a man's life turns into a cancer from being bruised and continually bruised and swells into a purplish mass like, like growths on stalks of corn. Here was I, a carpenter, mired in the bog of life into which I stepped thinking it was a meadow with a slattern for a wife, and, and poor Minerva, my daughter, whom you tormented and drove to death. So I crept, crept like a snail through the days of my life. No more you hear my footsteps in the morning, resounding on the hollow sidewalk, going to the grocery store for a little corn meal and a nickel's worth of bacon. Dora Williams, who had the reputation of a cunning gold digger and made a fortune killing off husbands. When Reuben Pantier ran away and threw me, I moved to Springfield. There I met a lush, whose father just deceased left him a fortune. He married me when drunk. My life was wretched. A year passed and one day they found him dead. That made me rich. I moved on to Chicago. After a time, met Tyler Roundtree, villain. I moved on to New York. A gray-haired magnet went mad about me. So, another fortune. He died one night in my arms, you know. I saw his purple face for years thereafter. There was almost a scandal. I moved on this time to Paris. I was a woman now, insidious, subtle, versed in the world, and rich. My sweet apartment near the Champs de Lassay was a center for all sorts of people. Musicians, poets, dandies, artists, nobles, where we spoke French, Italian, German, English. I wed Count Navigato of Genoa. We moved to Rome. Poisoned me, I think. And now, overlooking the Campo de Santo, where young Columbus dreamed of new worlds, see what they chiseled. Contessa Navigato, implora eterna quiete. Lillian Stewart, who claimed that her husband vexed her life till she went back home to father. I was the daughter of Lambert Hutchins, born in a cottage near the grist mill, reared in the mansion there on the hill, oh, with its spires, bay windows, and roof of slate. How proud mother was of the mansion, how proud of father's rise in the world and how father loved and watched us and guarded our happiness. But I believe the house was a curse, for father's fortune was little beside it. And when my husband found he had married a girl who was really poor, he taunted me with the spires and called the house a fraud on the world. He vexed my life till I went back home and lived like an old maid till I died, keeping house for father.
Dr. Myers, a respected town doctor who died disgraced and cursed. No other man, unless it was Doc Hill, did more for the people in this town than I. All the weak, the halt, the improvident, and those who could not pay flocked to me. I was good-hearted, easy Dr. Myers. I was healthy, happy, and comfortable fortune. Blessed with a congenial wife, my children raised, all wedded and doing well in the world. And then one night, Minerva, the poetess, came to me in her trouble, crying. I tried to help her out. She died. They indicted me. The newspapers disgraced me. My wife perished of a broken heart. And pneumonia finished me. Mrs. Merritt, whose young lover killed her husband, for which she also went to prison. Silent before the jury, returning no word when the judge asked if I had aught to say against the sentence, only shaking my head. What could I say to people who thought that a woman of 35 was at fault when her lover of 19 killed her husband? Even though she had said to him over and over, Go away, Elmer, go far away. I have maddened your brain with the gift of my body. You will do some terrible thing. And just as I feared, he killed my husband, with which I had nothing to do. Before God, silent for 30 years in prison, and the iron gates of Joliet swung as the gray and silent trustees carried me out in a coffin. Cassius Eufer, disappointed that the words on his tombstone were the opposite of what his life was really like. They have chiseled on my stone his life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature would stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Those who knew me would smile as they read this empty rhetoric. My epitaph should have been, life was not gentle to him, and the elements so mixed in him that he made warfare on life in the which he was slain. While I lived, I could not cope with slanderous tongue. Now that I am dead, I must submit to an epitaph graven by a fool. Archibald Higby loathed Spoon River for its lack of culture. I loathed you, Spoon River. I tried to rise above you. I was ashamed of you. I despised you as the place of my nativity. <sighs> but in Rome, among the artists, speaking Italian, speaking French, I seem to myself at times to be free of every trace of my origin. I seem to be reaching the heights of art and to Breathe the air the masters breathed, and to see the world with their eyes. <laughs> but still they'd pass my work and say, What are you getting at, my friend? Sometimes this face looks like Apollo's, and others it has the trace of Lincoln's. <sighs> there was no culture, you know, in Spoon River. And so I burned with shame and held my peace. And what could I do? All covered over and weighted down with western soil, except aspire and pray for a new birth in this world with all of Spoon River rooted out of my soul. the circuit judge, who admits that he was dishonest 
making unjust decisions that wronged many people. Take note, passers-by, of the sharp erosions eaten in my headstone by the wind and rain, almost as if an intangible nemesis or hatred were marking scores against me, it, but to destroy, not preserve my memory. I in life was the circuit judge, a maker of notches, deciding cases on the points the lawyers scored, not on the, the right of the matter. Oh, wind and rain, leave my headstone alone, for worse than the anger of the wronged, the curses of the poor, was to lie speechless, yet with vision clear, seeing that even Hod Putt, the murderer, hanged by my sentence, was innocent in soul, compared with me. A. D. Blood, the long-time honorable mayor of Spoon River. If you in the village think that my work was a good one, who closed saloons, stopped all playing at cards, and hailed old Daisy Frazier before Justice Arnett in many a crusade to purge the people of sin, why do you let the milliner's daughter, Dora, and the worthless son of Benjamin Pantier, nightly, make my grave their unholy pillow. Daisy Frazier, the town prostitute, who knew many secrets and was sent to court repeatedly and paid many fines as a result. Did you ever hear of Editor Whedon given to the public treasury any of the money he earned for supporting candidates for office? Or for writing up the cannon factory to get people to invest? Or for suppressing the facts about the bank when it was broke and ready to break? Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear of the circuit judge helping anybody except the Q Railroad and the bankers? Did you ever hear of Reverend Pete or Reverend Sibley giving any of the money they earned for keeping still or for speaking out? as the leaders wish them to, to the public waterworks. <laughs> but I, Daisy Fraser, who always passed along the streets through rows of nods and smiles and coughs and words such as, there she goes, <laughs> never once stood before Justice Arnett without first contributing $10 and costs to the school fund for Spoon River. Oscar Hummel, a town resident who was killed by A.D. Blood. I staggered on through darkness. There was a hazy sky, a few stars which I followed as best I could. It was nine o'clock. I was trying to get home, but somehow I was lost, though really keeping the road then I reeled through a gate and into a yard and called at the top of my voice, Oh, Fiddler! Oh, Mr. Jones! I thought it was his house and he would show me the way home. But who should step out but A.D. Blood in his nightshirt, waving a stick of wood? and roaring about the cursed saloons and the criminals they made. You drunken Oscar Hamel, he said, as I stood there weaving to and fro, taking the blows from the stick in his hand, till I dropped down dead at his feet. There are more tales to be told. Should you be in the area, stop by, walk among the graves, listen to the wind, trees, birds, 
and listen for tales from the long ago departed of Spoon River.